In One Piece chapter 1092, we saw the return of Fleet Admiral Sakazuki, aka Akainu. Back in action, he fought against Kuma. But it wasn't really a fight. It was more so a slaughter of a lamb. It's not to say I don't think Kumo used to be strong, but in this current state, he wasn't really focused on fighting anyway and had no chance and barely escaped, right? But that's not the important part of this. The important part of this was the dialogue to me. It was very interesting to see that Akainu seemed to feel bad for Kuma. That was very apparent. In the official translations, he says, You lost your free will long ago, I'm told. So if you're no different from a dead man, then where do you think you're going? That's when he attacks him, of course. And he says, well, at least you bleed like a man. And as Kuma runs away, he sees him in this pathetic state. Obviously just took his leg, burned off half his face. And a man running away with a clear destination in mind, he thinks back to capturing his daughter, Bonnie. And he told her, bark all you like, but Kuma's mind will never return to him. He volunteered to be reborn as a weapon. We see that Bonnie was calling him a liar and she was sad. He would never leave me behind. And Akanu remembers this interaction here. For some reason, he's thinking back to Bonnie. He's thinking back to what was his motivations for leaving her behind? What is he doing at this moment? He lost his free will. He says, where would you go? A mere puppet with no mind or will left. And he looks off into the distance in deep thought. And this kind of goes hand in hand with what we were seeing from Kizaru in the recent chapters as well, where he was going through emotional turmoil of having to come to terms with the fact that he's tasked with now assassinating his longtime friend, Vegapunk. He had to deal with Sentamaro, gave him the faith of a 1v1 to honor him and to give him the chance to defend if he was strong enough. Obviously, he wasn't. And even with Bonnie, it seems that there's closer ties between Kuma, Bonnie, and the Navy than previously thought. He says, look how big you are now, Bonnie. Kids these days grow, grow fast. I'd rather not hurt any acquaintances outside of my mission parameters. On one translation, he did call her an old friend. This is the official, so it's probably the most likely, but even an acquaintance, He's familiar with her. And it's not just like she was jailed that wouldn't qualify as an acquaintance in this sense. It has something to do with the past. But the reason I'm bringing all this in is because it seems that the admirals lately, even if we wanted to include Aokiji, who's obviously going through probably the most mental turmoil of everybody with what he's been tasked with, having to deal with his mentor, having to leave the Marines, aligning with people that have such skewed morality opposed to himself. Now, what I found interesting about that Akainu dialogue I mentioned earlier is that he called Kuma a puppet. And a lot of people like to say that Akainu is actually a puppet of the world government. So it was ironic for him to say this. He's a fleet admiral now. His wings have been clipped, so to speak. He's lost all freedom. He has to take shit from the celestial dragons. They're giving him flack about letting Kuma go. They're worried about their lobster dinners not being prepared. And in a sense, he has become a puppet. And Akainu has already showed hints of insolence toward the Gorosei. He's never been afraid to speak his mind to them. Signs of that rebellious nature creeping out where he knows that somebody above them is pulling the strings. He doesn't know who it is, at least as far as I'm concerned. I don't think he knows about Eam. And that begs the question, what happens when Akainu does find out about Eam? What happens when he finds out that the narrative they've been pushing is a lie, that there is someone sitting on the empty throne? Why is he working for these people? Especially because I don't think the Gorosei are going to be all that strong, to be honest with you. I think Eam will be more than likely. And obviously their science is going to be the key to their strength with the Mother Flame and whatever other ancient weapon they may or may not have. Obviously, the Mother Flame is a replication of an ancient weapon. But I don't think Akainu is liking the current situation he's in. I don't think he's liking the fact that he is effectively what Kizaru said earlier, a cog in the machine. And I think that Oda's making a conscious effort to show us these character building moments for even Akainu, who many had thought was heartless. We got a hint of this in Wano where he didn't want to send Kizaru to go to Wano because it was lawless jurisdiction. He wasn't being reckless. He wasn't going to send Marines to die there because no matter what you think about Kizaru taking on Kaido and Big Mom or whatever, he, whoever he was going to fight, a lot of Marine lives would have been lost if he took a whole fleet with him, no matter what. Even when you look back at the fact that he spared Aokiji in their fight, tells you that his sense of morality, albeit a little bit extreme, obviously Ohara and the fact that he killed Marines at Marine Ford that were being cowards, he represents absolute justice, but he has his own code. He respects Kuzan. That's why he gave him his freedom. That's why he did not kill him and finish him off. And even when you look back to the Gorosei mentioning Kuzan being with Blackbeard, I found this to be a little bit out of character because maybe I wasn't understanding his character to the fullest at this point. When Akainu tells them, don't worry about Kuzan, he's of no importance to us anymore. He's gone. I used to think, well, Akainu should want to go track him down. He spared him. And now he's going to align with 
perhaps the most powerful pirate in the world, that's a big time threat. This guy was on your level and he's gonna go align with, like I said, perhaps the most powerful pirate. Wouldn't I kind of take that personally? But when you really start putting the pieces together, you think, I think he wants Alkiji to have the freedom. He gave him that opportunity. He respected him so much from that battle, respected him as a Marine. Now it's, he's on his own. He's not going to be worried about that unless absolutely necessary. And that also leads to another theory that could Akainu and Aokiji have come to a deal only between them, unbeknownst to anybody else in the Marines, unbeknownst to even Sword. A lot of people speculate Aokiji might be in Sword. I'm not really sure if he's going to be in Sword. Don't think that's all that likely given them. A lot of Sword was accompanying Garp, and they don't seem to know about that, obviously. It doesn't mean they'd have to have all the secrets, but I wouldn't be surprised if Akainu and Aokiji came to a deal where Akainu talked to him and said, look, I understand you don't want to serve in the Marines beneath me, but you're too much of an asset to us to just let you leave like this when it's unnecessary. What if you take undertake a mission where you have absolute freedom, you don't have to be confined by my jurisdiction, you have more freedom than you ever had as an admiral, and you're still gonna be working for us. This goes in line with what he said to Smoker when he pulled up and saved him from Doflamingo, where he said he doesn't have to be within the Marines to make change, to aid the world with his own sense of justice. Aokiji aligning with the likes of Katarina Devon, who kills beautiful women for pleasure, and all these other crooks in Blackbeard's pirate, so to speak. It doesn't make any sense for Aokiji's whole mentality to take a 180, and now he's gonna be on the side of those who beforehand he probably thought being disgusting. Especially given that the man that trained him was Garp himself. I think Oda is setting the stage for potentially an admiral face turn. All of them, all the original three. I mean, Fujitora falls in line with this as well. I mean, obviously we've seen what he's already willing to do. He's directly going to oppose, a kind of directly oppose Green Bulls, freed the slaves. Whatever he deems right is what he defends no matter what. I do believe that Akainu, despite what everybody thinks, will eventually turn on the world government and will be an unsuspecting ally to the rebellion. Despite that, I do believe that Luffy and Akainu will have their fight. It's inevitable. It's definitely needed. But that fight might be the final thing that pushes Akainu to understand. I know people will say, like, oh, is that some kind of Takno Jutsu like Naruto? I wouldn't consider it the same if that did happen that way because we've seen the writing on the wall here. This is built up. Akainu in character should want to go against him. And I don't necessarily even think he has to lose to have that sense of awakening. He might end up helping. It'd be reminiscent of Goku and Frieza fighting in the Tournament of Power alongside each other, putting their differences aside. That would be something. That'd be crazy. It might go with Dragon. There's so many different possibilities here, but I do believe Akainu is going to face off with the Elders, Eam potentially, and defend his sense of justice. And I wouldn't be surprised if Aokiji's involved in the story at this point, Kizaru's involved. I'm just putting this out there that these guys have a lot more to them than meets the eye. Another very interesting point is that Oda himself stated that Akainu was going to be somebody he cherishes. He's based on one of Oda's favorite actors that he has absolute reverence for. He's going to give Akainu's character the utmost care. Does that sound like somebody that's going to be a generic villain? That's going to be all evil, all bad, through and through? Doesn't seem that way to me. I think Akainu has much, much more to give to this story and i'm here for all of it but what do you guys think let me know in the comments below and i'll see you guys in the next one peace